Thanks everybody for making it out today. Uh, my name is uh, Theo Sparopoulos. I, I direct the design research lab here and I have the pleasure today of in introducing, uh, I don't want to use the word old friend, but a long time friend, colleague, a uh, provocateur in his own right, uh, Vicente tonight, uh, who has served in the community of the AA in a lot of different roles as an invited critic, as a colleague to discuss issues of urbanism and architecture within the DRL, as an examiner for the undergraduate school. So the conversation has been one that's been ongoing, I think since almost 2000, as far as I'm aware. And tonight, I think it's very interesting to have the opportunity to bring Vicente back uh, because in his sort of career path at the moment, it's very interesting as being someone who's fundamentally tied to education, to practice, and really to the project of the city. And I think tonight, uh, in particular, he'll be discussing the issue of this kind of trajectory, particularly with his new role, which isn't so new, but is really the current uh, undertaking, which is the city of Barcelona as its chief architect. It doesn't need much of an introduction in terms of his education and background, but I think it's important to understand he's set up as one of the founders, the EAC school in Barcelona, which is a very good school for those who may not know. And at the same time, a practice which has always been working on the project of the city and urbanism and the complex relationships between that and trying to find a way where design plays a very active and strategic role. Uh, so with that, I will mention one thing, which in the back, at the end of the lecture, uh, there's a publication that Vicente has uh, called The Self-Sufficient City, which is on sale, and he'll be signing copies for those that are interested. It's the first time that's in English, so for those that don't speak Spanish, good opportunity. And anyway, with that, I'd like us to warmly welcome Vicente. Thank you, Theo. Um, well, for me, it's a pleasure to be back here at AA. Uh, I just was talking with Brett about uh, so many discussions that we have in the past. I am very happy to see that now you are back. You, are, you bought one quarter of Bedford Square. I suppose you will continue buying all the square in the next 150 years, but it will be great. The son of my son will be here. I will tell him to come. Uh, but today, I, what I would like to, I, I mean, I, somehow the last time I gave a lecture here was I was presenting another book. I did Geologics, was a book on my work. And uh, three years ago, just before to enter, to start to work for the city of Barcelona, I, I wrote a book because uh, I wanted somehow to kill some ideas or to, to write some ideas in order to pass from theory to practice. So before the campaign, I wrote that book that has been translated to English and to, to Chinese. Um, you can use this, my, this is my Twitter address and this is hashtag if anyone wants to use it. But I would like to start my presentation at the day that the mayor, the candidate of Barcelona came to the Institute of Advanced Architecture in March 2011 to present his campaign on, uh, on urban planning or urban development about the future of Barcelona. He presented at IAC this model was made by a student from, let's say, from 30 countries. Each of them has, in the first term, the year 2011, uh, he should fabricate with a 3D, with a CNC machine, uh, one part of the city, and then we make a huge model that was used at that moment uh, from uh, was used. Uh, for that presentation that day. Well, the miracle, I, I will say that, I mean, somehow this is a kind of miracle because we founded IAC, the Institute of Advanced Architecture, because we were a young generation after the Olympic Games. I remember the year 92 Olympic Games in Barcelona were great. 
in 96, uh, we start to see that we should invent something or we'll become a very old people without any project ever. And on the other hand, every time that you have a very success story, in some moment, this story will fail. And this is how what happened. We, we decided to create this master program. We founded the Institute of Advanced Architecture. And 15 years later, I, uh, we moved from this very radical situation to run the city of Barcelona. During the campaign, we were thinking how to explain to the big public radical ideas about the city. And we fabricate at the Institute these windows every day in the campaign where the mayor arrived, he opened the window and then what he found, what he was showing were some ideas like regeneration, self-sufficient blocks, or, uh, yeah, or renaturalization, uh, or the fab labs and digital fabrication on top uh, on the 16 Barcelona. So somehow we the, he pres we, we presented ourselves during the campaign with those radical ideas. And I would like to explain to you today is how we move from this situ position to uh, to run in the city as we are doing right now. Well, this is a diagram that is included in the book that. Uh, I, I make in order, I discover a rule. I discover a rule about the phases of the development of Barcelona. Those are the walls of Barcelona. This is the Roman wall uh, that was, Barcelona was founded by Romans. We are like Roman soldiers. Uh, they came, it was a kind of touristic village for the Romans because the capital was Tarraco, a little bit like today. No, we had too many tourists. The Romans used Bar Barquino as a touristic city. But then this is in the Middle Age, we make another wall, the Christian wall. In 400 years later, we decide to demolish the wall. Uh, 150 years later, we f we make the highway, we make a kind of other wall. And then the challenge that we have, the, 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 the vision that we have for the future of Barcelona, it will take like 40 years from now on to be to be developed. This is important because when, when you are running a city, normally you are facing problems that are daily problems. And if you don't, you don't have a long term vision, then it's impossible that you do anything new. The cities are full of people that would like to run business as usual because they know what they know. And then for many people, the best status is to do a little bit every day, but without, uh, let's say, a long term vision. And our mission, obviously, is to bring all those rad that radical ideas that we were dis discussing to the reality. So Barcelona for us will be somehow the, the place where we start this story and where we would like to see many of those ideas uh, on, on place. So this is the Barcelona 1.0, the Roman city. If you go to the city today, you can see some, still some of the Roman walls and some columns of this temple. Um, the Roman city is here, and this was the medieval city. I will explain you later some story about all of this. But then this was a very critical moment in this drawing is from middle of 19th century when the people were, the city really was very crowded, was very dense. The, the industrialization uh, was arriving to Barcelona and then uh, we decided to demolish the walls like in Vienna and many other European cities and then to make a plan to uh, to develop the city. So Cerda, Ildefon Cerda made this plan that was at that time the biggest master plan made in, in, in the world. London is a city of streets and Barcelona is a grid. So this is a very big difference. New York, like Barcelona, is like a grid. And there are few cities in the world that are like London because it has a kind of a strange medieval inspiration following these old roads, no? It's like all of this was also based in these roads and you see the roads. So, but Barcelona, uh, someone that was an engineer called Cerda, he made this master plan, he wrote the general theory of urbanization. And in fact, in two years will be the 100th anniversary of the invention of the word urbanism. The word urbanism, he was a social utopist and then he thought that he should improve the life of people. He should offer 
um, let's say, uh, fresh water, light, trees, etc. that this is something that didn't exist at that moment in the street, that somehow were the evolution of a, a system that was created by aggregation. So he uh, proposed this master plan, you will see later how all of this evolved, and at the same time he proposed also to break the historical part uh, in order to open uh, and to allow the, the fast mobility. This is 1992 drawing for the Olympic Games in London. Uh, I mean, when we talk with uh, with Rick, Ricky Bardet from the London School of Economics, that is a good friend. He always say that they were inspired here in London by the Barcelona model because we had a great opportunity to define a project to develop it very fast using the skills of the Olympic Games and instead to make a kind of uh, uh, an area to, to, I mean, instead to transform only one area of the city, we use this excuse in order to transform the whole city. So Rio still says that they are using the Barcelona model, that is to use the, the good excuse of the Olympic Games in order to transform the city. So this was a very historical moment. But the question obviously after these big success is what's next, what we should be doing. This is a diagram that explains very well the mexicity of Barcelona. If this, those are all the styles of architecture, all the big cultural uh, moment of architecture from the Western side, because here we don't have the Chinese time or the Islamic time, let's say. If we start from Egypt to all the, uh, our influence in Barcelona, you can find many of those moments of the history and basically in Barcelona you can find some areas of the city that some people say Barcelona look, sometimes looks like Florence, sometimes look like Paris, sometimes look like New York. So it's a kind of mixed city and our mission obviously here you see is to see how we follow with all this history. If you think, I mean there are very few cities in the world like London, I mean, where you can find Gothic architecture, you can find Renaissance, you can find 19th century and also modern architecture. In Florence, you don't find modern architecture or in Rome or in New York, you don't find medieval architecture. So that means that this idea in Rome, they are frozen by the Roman stones, no? And you will see now, every time that we see a Roman stones, we do a party, but we make a building on top of it. So so we, we learn how, how to play with with the with the history another thing very important for us is uh, that is connected with the work i'm trying to bring some kind of radical research or the knowledge that we have about the science of cities to the to the administration and also to we, we use this kind of drawing for example we were asking ourselves I was asking uh, myself how many different urban fabrics has Barcelona, because in fact we don't know. We are doing architecture or we are making cities by default. We are copying each other. We, uh, we are trying to upgrade a little bit what we learn from the other cities, but the, the, it's incredible that we don't have a real science of cities. The, today, uh, I mean, if here there are many uh, architects or students of architecture, what I would like to say, and this is the most important thing I will say, is that you are really very important people. I mean, the pe some people say that architecture is over, there, are, there is a big crisis, etc. But more and more, uh, the people are living in cities, we are making, we are growing the cities in the world, we are transforming our cities, we are, uh, I mean, uh, upgrading the cities using new technologies. And the question is that the only people that are seeing, I, I, I mean, I, I, am, I am really excited when, when we talk are in general architects, that we are able to talk about everything and nothing. But the most important thing is that we are able to make drawings. If you want to make a revolution, you need a poet or someone that drawing, because you need to create some diagram that really enter here. So from that point of view, right now, we need more and more architects, we need more and more designers, and we need people that really are not obsessed about forms, about copy styles, the idea of architecture as a fashion. For me, this is over. I mean, Lehman Brothers killed all these 
let's say, formal approach to architecture. Architecture is becoming more and more social, and at the same time, technology is crucial. The processes and the construction and the implementation about how we run cities in the future. So from that point of view, the fact that we learn how to integrate solution, history, culture, etc., is crucial. And from th this point of view, uh, we are uh, developing, working, creating science about cities, how we can, how many different urban fabrics we have in Barcelona. In fact, we have eight. Uh, but at the same time, because we are collaborating with many cities around the world, we try to analyze and to learn from other cities in order to see how we can apply solutions, projects, etc., to our own city. So this is one of the research that we are doing from the city. That's another important diagram that explains this is the Cerda master plan, and this is 2004, and this explains that every 25 years there is a different generation. In Barcelona, here we had Cerda, but here we had Gaudí, here we have Cert and Le Corbusier, Coder, can uh, the Italian school after war, here we have the school of Barcelona Boigas, and we always thought that here there was no one. We were looking around, we didn't see anyone, and we thought, it's us. I mean, we are the people. We should be there. If not, who else will be doing what we are doing? And by luck, I mean, or by, because we work very hard with the mayor, etc. the question is that we are doing here a mission, here, but at the same time, we are defining the long-term vision. And this is absolutely crucial. We work every day because we have a long-term vision. And this is the long-term vision. Every city should have a mantra, should have a very clear statement about what we want, what they want to be. Barcelona wants to become a self-sufficient city. Here, incredible. This is the mantra of Barcelona, and this is, it was somehow defined in this book. We want to become a self-sufficient, city and the idea is to use the model of internet for the next city. The model of internet is a distributed model, small pieces that are connected and this is exactly what we say, the small pieces are the neighborhoods. We live in a big city that in fact is a metropolis and sometimes is a country, but the real scale where the people live are the neighborhoods. You will see later with some drawings. So we imagine the future of cities organized around productive neighborhoods that work at human speed, where the people can walk to work, can walk to buy food, can produce energy locally, can fabricate things using 3D printers, etc. And we will be able to do this because we are hyper-connected to the world and because at the same time we are in the global scale a zero emission city. So we want to mix the best from what we call, what, what are, is called the slow cities and the smart cities. That means a, a definition of an scale, I mean, the future of cities are metropolis of neighborhoods. The future of cities are not rich centers and poor peripheries. This is what we have today in many Latin American cities, but this is the end somehow of some forms of living uh, from the 20th century. If we are really smart and we work well, we'll be able to distribute the richness and the productivity, the innovation that we can have in the center of the city to everywhere. And that's why an, another crucial diagram is this diagram where we see, we imagine another man in the center of our project, a man that is able to produce things locally, self-sufficiency means to be able to produce energy, things and food, that are the three basic things that you need in order to live, and we'll be able to do this if we are connected uh, through the information networks to social, economical and knowledge network. If we, each of us, will be like this, then we'll be able to build a society like this, a society of free men that are connected and we are somehow empowered. The idea that information technology should allow to be more powerful, each of us, and we create the society because we work together and it's not someone that is rolling us. Kings somehow are over. We still have kids to, to take pictures, but they are not ruling anymore the world. So the people are ruling the world or the people should rule the world. And the way, the diagram that came after this idea of the empowered people that rule the world is this word, um, 
organized around three people that are connected. Another crucial diagram that is in an early version in this book is the idea of the urban anatomy. Because another incredible thing is that, I mean, a doctor in Abu Dhabi, Barcelona, or London could describe the human anatomy in the same way. Because anatomy has a science, has a book that you open, and there is no doubt about the difference between a bone, a muscle, or whatever. But an architect in Abu Dhabi, London, or Barcelona will describe the city in a very different way. If I will ask which are the parts of your city, he will say something. He will talk about, oh, it's very clear, we have streets, we have health, and we have people. It's like to talk about the blood, uh, I mean, my, uh, my blood pressure, and my whatever. Is, I mean, there is in, in cities or urbanism, on, on urban planning, there are not, there is not a clear definition about the science of cities that ought, each of us, we can share the same language. And this is what we try to do with this diagram that explain that a city uh, is organized, has three parts. It, it, the city has the, phys the physical part that could be this, the human or social part that is here, and then the information part that is between the physical, the structure, the physical domain, and the people. No? And then inside the physical uh, domain, the structure, we have the environment. We have the environment, we have the infrastructures, that are six infrastructures, six and only six information, water cycle, energy, the matter cycle with food and industrial production, and the trash, and then uh, mobility and the green. And then here we have the public spaces connecting all these layers, and the multi-scalar approach to the build domain uh, can be defined from any object in the world, buildings, blocks, neighborhood, etc., to the whole planet. So this drawing came from the from the early research at uh, at uh, IAC, and right now is something that we are using every day because, in fact, what we decide is to create a department in the city of Barcelona. Before us, there was the Department of Environment, the Department of Transportation, and then Energy and Infrastructures, and then the Department of Urban Planning and Housing, and the Department of ICT. And we decide to break silos and to create only one department called Urban Habitat. And in fact, I was the first manager of the Urban Habitat. I am the chief architect of the Urban Habitat, not only about the build domain. Traditionally, architects work here, and then when they make a design, they call a, a let's say, an, an engineer that make the energy or whatever, or a landscape landscaper that deals with this, and then about ICT, we use Rhino or whatever, but then we don't know anything about how to really uh, um, connect our building to our router. So now we work in the city of Barcelona with only one department where the projects that we are doing are trying to connect all these four layers. And I will explain you. So somehow the city of the future is exactly this. It's about blurring, blurring the division. It's about architects or a new profession that is able to talk at the same time about the nature or about the water. And a, a very good sample. I mean, all of us, we know what is a meter. We know what is a kilogram. But if I ask you what is a kilowatt, this is a, the energy units are not in our brain, no? So we should be able to understand how we can produce one kilowatt or how many water we consume every day or how we, what, how many bytes are moving, whatever, no? So this is a very important diagram that uh, uh, we are using every day. This was the Barcelona of the 92, but I want to, this is the, remember this diagram with the, the Ronda that we built in the 92, the four Olympic areas. And we are, now I am working, I will show you drawings that I am working right now in order to explain everyone in the city, which is our vision for the, the urban structure of the city. The mantra is already explained. I will show you some drawings, connected projects connected with the mantra. But at the urban scale, I want to explain to you what are the main projects we are developing. The first one, Barcelona, 
I didn't show you any picture, but Barcelona has some mountain, has the sea, and it has two rivers. And the first question is that the city, like many other cities, I was working in Iran in the past. I was also in, in Colombia working in Bogota. Those two cities have a mountain in the background and Barcelona has a mountain. But the question is, we were extending our cities against the nature. The history of urbanization is how we occupy the nature, agriculture or forest or whatever. And then in some moment we realized that we should stop and we should take into consideration the nature. And then we should uh, start to bring nature back, how we reconnect the, ne the, the nature with the city. Uh, you can see here, we make the highway, and when we make the highway, like the Boulevard Peripheric in Paris, what we did was to cut absolutely the relation between the nature and the city. So that's why we launched it. Here we are w making a 22 kilometers path along here, that is exactly this one. Uh, the first project we did when we arrived to the administration was to launch 16 simultaneous competitions called the 16 Coisola Gates in order to uh, develop different projects about this reconnection between the nature and the city. So this was the diagram, how we bring back nature, how we make parkings, etc. We are publishing right now a book about this competition. We want to bring, a, a, a grow agriculture again in the limits of the city, but also inside the city. So all of this was uh, agriculture land when the people really was, the cities were more self-sufficient when they were growing food. It doesn't make sense to make a tomato in Brazil, to put into a container, to lose 40% of the tomatoes in the transportation and then to eat in Barcelona. Why? Because in fact we are using, let's say the poor people in Brazil, we are exploiting them in order to eat tomatoes in Barcelona. It doesn't make sense at all. What it makes sense is that we grow our tomatoes and after that we start to deal about which kind of commerce we can do. But uh, I mean, um, Absolutely, it doesn't make sense to make resources in one part of the planet and also to use resources, energy, etc., for transportation. So another radical project that was developed in this competition that is here was about to connect these two natural areas. And then they came an architect with this drawing, the idea of during many years we were making highways and trains, etc., but now we are reconnecting nature like this. So the idea is to reconnect nature and to use these kind of structures in order to make a green bridge that will promote the right to walk, the right to, to, to ride, the, the right to, to be uh, in the nature. Now we have the right to drive. We have the right to drive from Barcelona to Moscow, but we cannot walk, let's say. So now we are reconnecting nature. And in this case, we are using some geometry, as you can see here, I would like to show you one of the most beautiful structure built in Barcelona. There are some young people using some plugins for Rhino in order to make these vaults. And they are using the traditional Catalan vault in order to make such a structures. So we will use some advanced tools in order to reduce traditional materials. This is earth. With earth and fire and water, we can use these, we can make bricks. And with this, we can do uh, incredible, beautiful uh, structures. Somehow using the tradition that we have, Guastavino was an architect that moved to New York and he made some of the most beautiful vaults like the Boston Library or the Grand Central Station in New York was done by some people from, from Barcelona using these traditional, um, traditional uh, materials and systems. So as you can see, we can use new technologies, but reusing some traditional um, systems to make very contemporary project. Another project, um, and this is by Daura. This is the last project I launched from IAC. We, we bought this property in the same way that you have, uh, how is it called? Eh? Hook Park. 
AJ has Hook Park, Jack has Baidaura. The big difference is Hook Park is four hours away and Baidaura is four minutes away. So is Baidaura is, uh, well, I will, I will use it now, it's just besides Barcelona. But this, this house was made at the same moment here. I mean, these guys were incredible. They make a factory to make bricks and they were making all these walls in order to make agriculture around this house. So Baidaura is exactly here. Now you remember, this is Barcelona, the center of Barcelona, the Romans. This is Baidaura that is inside this natural park. This is the house and this is, was the brick factory. This is Barcelona. The Foster Tower is here. And Baidaura, we, we use it. There are several drawings on Baidaura here. Yeah, in order to explain this, the idea a self-sufficient city should produce diagrams like this. Right now, there are people talking about what is called the circular economy. That means that you should be able to, instead, today the cities are, we import products and we produce trash. So the cities are machines to transport products into trash. And then we, in, in general, with the trash, we make mountains or we burn it or we do whatever. But the question will be how we can close the circle and with the trash, as the, those people used to make, with the trash, you can produce some new goods and then with this, you can reduce it, etc. This is how everything should work. And this is how we used to work in the past. But right now, with the industrialization we for and globalization, we forgot it. So we'll be able to do this because we'll be learning and sharing knowledge through the networks. It's not about to be isolated. It's about to be hyper-connected. But then the diagram, in this case, you see from the trees you can make, you see now we can make wood, and with the wood you can make energy, or you can make some uh, chairs or tables or whatever. And then with the food, I mean, there are many with the water, etc. There are many, many circles. And the question is how we can develop a diagram like this at the scale of a city. This is the diagram we make for Baidaura. And this is another diagram because we launched a project called Energrid. Energrid is the internet of energy. Today, there is a new concept that is the internet of things that here at AIA, I'm sure you will be understanding because when no one was talking about connecting internet and the things, here at the day, you were doing incredible research. We also were doing this kind of research since the year 2000. And now, but now is, I mean, the, the business is here. Cisco is here, IBM is here. Everyone wants to transform a city into an, a territory that is upgrading and working better because they are using more information. And the way to use information in cities is to mix the information and the physical things. Is to put intelligence in every object and then to create an intelligent environment by the, connect, the connection of many things. This space will be more intelligent, dynamic, or whatever, if every small part has some intelligence than not if there is a computer behind that is controlling the, the, the room. No? So this is the project we launched here and with Endesa, the idea, and this is how the city will work in the future. Every building will produce energy. The energy will be com consumed, stored in the car or stored in batteries. And if they don't use it, they will be sharing with other buildings nearby or they will be sharing with the network. In order to develop this, we, we fabricate with the Polytechnic University. This is a internet server that costs like five dollars. It's a, a small computer that you can put everywhere in every electrical element. It has sensors, but it, it can get information. So the idea is to, uh, to, uh, to, to have a higher, a world with higher resolution of information. Today in your house, maybe you, you can count how many energy you consume, but you count by house. Here, you will count by object, and every object will be a kind of uh, sensor or an element that can receive and can give in information. So this is the idea of the Internet of Energy, and this is the idea of the Internet of Water. You know, in order that Internet runs, we need hard drives. We can have YouTubes because the information is stored everywhere. 
And every time we ask for a video, there is a hard drive that launch this video. There are many hard drives around the world. So what is the internet of water? If we don't share information and we share water, what means a hard drive for the water? And this is the diagram because, I mean, information has meaning and we break in packets and we distribute it. This is how internet works. The internet of energy or the electrons are similar. So you can, I cannot send you a kilowatt by the network because the electrons are the same. I can send you an email, but I cannot sell you a, a kilowatt. I could send some water. The question is that the water has chemical properties and you can have here clean water, a water that is still clean because you took from the roof, another a little bit more dirty water from the floor, gray water coming from the shower and black water coming from the toilet. And you can use better water. So with this water, you see, you can reuse with clean water, you can drink, obviously, but then with the gray water, you cannot drink gray water, but you can use for the toilet. So that means that you can use different water for different uses. And in order to make a kind of local management of water, then you need to set up a structure that is, could be called the Internet of Water. Well, that's another vault we are doing at the IAC. In Baidaura, this is. Yeah, and that's another incredible project we are developing that is the idea that every object should have an IP address or should have a digital identity. Because if we are, uh, we want really to control how the matter flows around the world, then we should know where things are coming from. And obviously we should try that things are coming from the, as near our produce as near as we can. So here we did a map on some trees we were cutting from Baidaura. Then we, we make a picture of uh, uh, every tree. I don't know why the trees doesn't have names, no? The pets has name, dogs has name, but trees doesn't have name. All the trees here in the square should have a name, no? It should have an IP address or a GPS address or something, no? They are like something, no? Okay, so with these trees, what we did was to cut in order to, to, to follow which part of wood after to bring to the aserradero, was from each tree we painted. And then at the end, what we did was to use a CNC and we produce our first chair that is the son of a tree. Now, so we, knew, we know which tree is the father of that chair. So this is the idea of the traceability of everything. In this case, the traceability I mean, we know who are the fathers of this girl. And now we know the fathers of the chair. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> no, this could be a joke. But remember, every object in the world will have an IP address. And with our telephone, we'll make like this. We'll see the, where was produced the wine, who, who made that bread, who designed that chair. We need to have a better and more precise information about where everything is coming from. Okay, the second big structure or big system in the city is the river that I will not talk very much, but here we have, you see that it seems that everything is built, but here we need to spend like 30 years in order to transform everything. I mean, before we have a highway node, but look at this highway. I mean, it's in, it's in the middle of the city. It doesn't make sense. You will see later what we do with places like this. We don't like them inside the city, obviously. So this is the, uh, here we have another, this is by the sea, here is the river. Uh, we are working in a project for this factory. This is the waterfront. And here I will sh explain you a short history about what happened in the 92, because in the 92, Barcelona was still a very industrial city. We have the trains that were separating the city from the sea. And then we decided to put all the infrastructures underground. And then we make here the Olympic Village, but all the beaches, if you go to Barcelona and you go to the beach, the beach was invented in the 92. So those are artificial creations. So that's why we have these uh, dikes or yeah, these, these elements because they allow the, the beaches to remain. So this is the Olympic Villa. 
And now, well, this is an incredible place that this is absolutely a human project. So if you go to a city and you see something, someone thought about it. And I mean, things are not produced in a, <laughs> I mean, the nature did, uh, God did a great job making everything. But then the men we contribute making things like this, creating beaches, making cities, and a city is uh, an artificial construction. Yeah. This is another thing, the harbor and Montjuic with the castle. And uh, now we are trying to bring the city here, past the city in front of the mountain that right now is the harbor. That's the typical tension between the industrial activities and in this case very obsolete and the urban activities. And now we are, you, you see here, we want to extend the city in that direction over the harbor. And we are transforming a highway, elevated highway, into an underground highway, and, and we are creating a kind of promenade along the harbor. That's the other river, El Llobregat, with the airport that is here. Well, many logistic uh, projects. We do many, many, many different projects, and the new terminal for cruises. Well, now I would like to tell you a little bit about the history that this is a really magical thing. So Barcelona, as you know, was uh, surrounded by walls and there is a long history about uh, Spain was created by the union on Catalonia and Castilla. Basically, I mean, they were married, the two kings in 1480 or some, yeah. And, but then in 1714, uh, the king died without a son, and there was a battle in Europe about who should be running Spain. The French wanted Spain, and also the British were helping with the Austrians, were helping Catalonia to, uh, to get the Austrian king. And at the end, uh, the French uh, attacked Barcelona. There was a siege during uh, one year, and finally uh, the French took over. And you see 300 years later, we are still discussing. We are trying to get independence because uh, we lose a battle, not bad. I mean, we are still here. But the French did what the, everyone that, uh, uh, that, uh, that take over a city does, is to destroy 20% of the city. If you take over a city, you will destroy 20% because people should know who is ruling the city. And what those people did was to destroy this part of the city and then they make a castle that was controlling the city. So the guns were in order, uh, here not to uh, not looking to outside, but looking to inside, because in order to stop any revolt from the local people. But then one day we decide to demolish the walls, as I say, in the middle of 19th century, uh, and we make our first Universal Expo in 1888. And here, this was the area where this old city was destroyed. And here we decide to make a market that is here, this one, yeah, this is the market that was made by a French architect. Yeah, because we have a, we still have a French king, a Bourbon. And uh, well, the, this structure was built. We had this market, but then the market was abandoned. And then one day we decide when the market was abandoned in the 20th century, each of these stages is 100 years. Eh? But 15 years ago, we decided to make a competition, to make a library, to make here inside the market the library. But then we start to excavate, to store the books. And what we found, we found the old city. We found the city that was destroyed by the French. And then we decide to save this part of the city. And right now we have an incredible place where you can visit. This is the structure of the old market, as you see. This is the, yeah, and this is the level of the old city. So as in many, in, in, in some countries, the people were asking the citizens to destroy their house. So that's why they destroyed so carefully. They were destroying the house carefully. They said they should be, it should be only one meter high. And that's why when we excavated, we were able to recover the city. So this is, a very clear explanation of what Barcelona is. You can see here structures and stones from the Middle Age 
that was a city that was destroyed in the 18th century, the structure made in the 19th century, and here we open a new cultural center in the 20th century. We have, we discover into a room, into another market, a Roman street. So what I say was not a joke. We discover a Roman street and in the future in another market, we'll be able to see a Roman street, 2000 years old, the medieval city, 19th century city and today's city. I designed the flag. I mean, this is something I did, no? This is what the chief architect does. Sometimes they ask you how you design a flag and then, yeah, I, we did a flag. <laughs> but that's really very nice place because then in the, the square around, we, we draw the here with the, well, you can see different textures. This is the old structure of the city here we're building, this was a street. And in this public space now, we, we made the concert of the 300th anniversary of the day that we lose against the French, not bad, so. Public space is really crucial for Barcelona, and that's another important question. When we were trying to, I mean, the public space, this is something you should try to think in. What, what is the definition of public space in your city? I see here people from many different cultures. In Barcelona, public space is crucial because we are not the capital of anything. We are a city that is very civic city. The architecture is so important because it's the representation of the goals of people. I mean, in Washington, Paris or Beijing, you can see incredible structures, great access, because this is the capital and the representation. Here in London, we can see something like this. But in places like New York or Barcelona or Amsterdam, you see that the representation of what the people are is described through architecture in buildings that are regular buildings or factories or not the parliament, because we don't have, but these a factory or a concert hall, an opera hall. And in our case, we use public space in order to represent what we think about ourselves as a collective. So that means that every economical and social progress is represented in public space. And then we do things as simple as this. With only one drawing, someone makes in the year 92 the definition of how all the sidewalks of Barcelona and the crosswalk should be defined. So we make a standard and this standard has been used in the last 25 years in order to bring the same quality to the center and to the periphery. So the poorest place in the city will use the same kind of stones because this is the representation that we are only one city. If you go to Mexico the F and you go to the center, you see uh, high rises and you go to the periphery and you see incredible construction that the people made but without any infrastructure, then this is the definition of what a city should try not to be. You see what happened in Medellin, that they learned from Barcelona and they try to bring public transportation and public facilities to, the, to these places. This is the vision how you could transform places like this. But they explain you this in order to connect to the digital world because we make a standard for the sidewalks and now we are making a standard about how we'll bring digital technologies to the public space. Because Barcelona owns a fiber optic network. We own our own network, the, the, the municipality. And what we decide is that we have, remember the diagram, we own the light post, we own the trees, we own the streets. Many cities doesn't own the fiber, uh, fiber optics and then you need to pay every time that you, you want to be connected. Imagine that you, you need to pay every time that you walk in the street. This is what, in fact, in London you do in order to control the contamination. But, uh, and this is what happened in some highways. But this idea of the relation between the private and the public, for us, if digital technologies are crucial for 21st century, should be part of the public infrastructure. So that's why we, this is the diagram that explains that every uh, kilometer will have an access point and then we'll have routers all over here. So I, I asked Areti, and uh, now we're running the master of uh, IAC, 
I ask uh, uh, Areti to to make or to work on the definition of how to bring this technology to the public space. We took the decision to put routers in the light post. And then we will cover the whole city with Wi-Fi. But what is more important, every sensor that we put in the street can could be connected to these points. Because if not, that means that the transportation department will arrive with their guys and will put some machines with some sensors. The light department will put another sensors, another routers or whatever. So we are doing only one infrastructure that will connect any kind of sensor. For example, this is for parking. We are putting some sensors for parking in the public space. They are connected to this point. Or sensors about noise or whatever, many kind of sensors. And the way to do this is we obviously need to work with engineers, telecom engineers and architects. And one day we decide uh, to, to, to put all of them together. And then we ask them which machines we should put in the light post because we wanted to cover and to design the integration into the public space. So we had that meeting, this is a camera, this is a router, this is a box with some sensors. And then the result again is one drawing. With one drawing, we define a new standard about the integration of all these elements into in the same, the right high, etc. And then we design this cylinder like this, that we will be putting everywhere around the city. So that means that every time that we transform one part of the city, one street, etc., will bring fiber optic. Now we have 500 kilometers of fiber optic owned by the city, and now we'll be able to deploy free Wi-Fi in the public space and any kind of sensors. For example, these, um, these, uh, I mean, the driveless, the driveless car or the drone that bring you pizza. Now, in the future, there will be many drones uh, bringing pizza to all of us, and then they will collapse. Imagine, no, no, we need to have a good information system that say, please. So we need to have to really distribute the, the information in the city. Now, it seems to be a joke, but imagine that this is what happened in many cities, and maybe in London, that the fiber optic is owned by Telefonica or a private company. That means that every time that you imagine that you are going to develop an information system or whatever, then you are paying them, but it's crazy. So our vision about what a city means, that is a public structure that is owned by the collectivity is very well represented here. We are also developing the city operation system. It doesn't make sense that this computer has a Windows operation system by my, the city that is much more expensive and bigger. We have the city of information is organized by silos. So what we are doing is breaking silos and then developing the city operation system with some companies we are doing right now. We are developing an area, a new area where we'll uh, create a cluster with companies of technology. We will have Cisco here. Cisco, in fact, I was here in London somewhere around the Millennium Dome where they have some reset center and we'll have a recent center about the internet of everything here. Another layer are the two mountains in Barcelona. We had this was the Olympic mountain. Right now we are working here to develop a big museum here we'll have the Museum of Architecture, finally. This is the Mies van der Rohe Pavilion. And uh, what we want to do build in the 1929, we want to make a new Museum of Architecture here. And that's another hill where we are also working. This is a secret place in Barcelona where you have the best view on the city. But these are the two diagonals that we are working. Uh, this is what is called the di diagonal uh, with the grid and Sagrada Familia that we are also working with. The, we want to finish in 2026. That will be 100th anniversary of the death of uh, Gaudi. But you, you see, we need to demolish some part of building here. So we are also working on how to make the right entrance to the. We launch a competition right now. 
Yeah, in the diagonal we make, uh, we used to make, as, as I say, in Barcelona, when the people have some idea, they send some tweets and some emails and we organize some demonstration. So here we make a huge last September 11. 300 years later, we lose Barcelona against the French. We organize a huge V. Those are people dressed in red or yellow t-shirts and they, we make a huge flag, a huge V. I mean, it was a party. I mean, <laughs> it was in order to say to the world that we want to vote, we want to vote. And in fact, we were watching the television and we saw the Scottish voting and we thought, well, that's good. And we saw Cameron and say, yeah, we are Democrats, we like to vote. Yeah, we like it very much. But we are rolling still by French. I mean, what a disaster. So, but anyhow, here we make the V. I mean, the V that was built was huge. It was 11 kilometers of V, huge. More than 1.5 million. The biggest demonstration ever in Europe here. But we are making this other diagonal. Yeah, and remember this place here? This was the center of the Gran Vía, the big avenues uh, following the plan of Cerda. But I mean, look at this. The squares are squares, but he rotate the square. And then, I mean, that night he he had a bad night. I mean, he, he is, some of you, sometimes you, you make a mistake, but there is a professor saying, no, this is wrong. The professors are always right. And then in this case, he didn't, anyone that said this was wrong, and then he made the wrong square, and we have been during many, many years thinking how to finish it. I mean, we were so bad that someone make a highway there. So this is the, because there was nothing, I mean, there was no city there because they were still looking to where someone make a rotunda and we build a highway. And uh, well, we thought that this is not part of our mantra. Remember, productive neighborhoods at human speed. Human speed is not car speed. So the cities were took, the cars took over the cities and this only happened in the last 50 years because they, uh, before the World War, the Second World War, there were not so many cars in the in the street. So the question here is: We decide we we make this drawing. This is a drawing we we make in order to say this should be a square, this should be green, and then the vision is uh, we should demolish the highway and we launch a competition about it. So these those are part of the competition and. Finally, the winner was this one that proposed in a very intelligent way the creation of a big, big park. Then, in fact, this was our proposal to make a tunnel here in this direction, then to make the diagonal as a pedestrian, and then to make here a big park. So the most incredible thing when you are running a city is that you 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 need to develop projects that are very cheap and very small. Remember the dome, and you need to take a decision to demolish something like this and to make a project that it will take like ten years to to finish. And in fact, this was the highway just one year ago, and what we did was. We demolish it. It costs 25 million euros, like imagine 20 million pounds to demolish it. We make this space like this because now we are we are going to make the tunnel from here to there. We are going to make the tunnel and uh, yeah, it's like this. We will make the tunnel from the center. And if you go right now there, you will see we learn another thing. It will take like, look at this, there, there are many buildings to be made here. It will take more than 10 years to finish. And then we learn how to make provisionally small parks here. Because if not, you close one portion of the city for 10 years. So what we learn is that we should open this for construction. We should open during the construction and we are investing like 5% of the total budget into light structure that will allow, in fact, right now, some people are able to come here during the construction period. And this is something crucial. 
architects in general, we work with space, but we should learn about working with time. We should introduce the time into our projects. And then what it is it, great in 10 years will be like this, but will happen with the, during the 10 years. No, it's like the streets. You, we, we design a street and we imagine this will give, be for cars, this for pedestrian. But what happened when, during the weekends or what happened during the night? No. So the idea that using information, we can manage the space during time. That's another crucial thing that we'll do the next years. So look at here, here we used to have, because this was the periphery of the city, they make a free market, but uh, we decided to demolish the free market and to make this new free market. So this was the free market like two years ago, but we close it because we designed this. So we make the most expensive free market in the world <laughs> where you can buy, I mean, anything by one euro. Um, but like this, you can buy anything. It's very popular, but the, the, the truth is that it's a very fantastic structure that it will evolve during the time. So this is a public market in the Plaza de las Glorias, and this is the, the train, the train, another, this is a big, our biggest pro project in Barcelona, where we'll make this, look at this, this is the train that will cover by a huge park, and we already start to, to cover with this, all this infrastructure. Yeah, another incredible thing, and this is the most radical project we are doing. You see Barcelona is a grid. Remember the drawing, that's the miracle. So how we make a drawing, and 100 years later, you see the city and it's there. So this is the miracle of drawings. If the drawing and the solution is so powerful, it will success. So drawings are really very important. Uh, this is the center part of Barcelona, and this is some areas that you see that here the grid finish here, and we have some areas that are not like a grid here. And about our transportation system, we have a bus system that is something like this, no? I never take the bus in Barcelona, no? You see, it's impossible to understand how to take a bus. In fact, no, it's true. Sometimes I did the test. I tried to take a bus and then I appear. I was here. I was trying to go there, but I, I appear here because the lines were created in some moment following some logics like, well, here is residential, here is industrial. We make, you know, and the, the reality is really very complex. But then someone say, someone 10 years ago, hey, if Barcelona is like a grid, why don't we make vertical lines, horizontal lines, and that's all. And some people say, yeah, it's a great idea. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> but the problem, in fact, the problem is not the drawing, that someone made the drawing, is that imagine the bus is something that all people in general take buses because they don't go to metro because it's more difficult. And then about the buses, normally the people has been taking the same bus during 30 years. The driver has been the same during 30 years. So it's a kind of family, the driver and the people there. <laughs> And if one day you say, no, no, we are going to improve the city, we'll kill the line. I mean, the people will kill themselves, no? It's something very hard, you can imagine. <laughs> but the truth is, we, the idea was to make this a structure and then to have a, a, a bus stop here, and then in any point of the city, you will have a four bus stop uh, in less than five minutes walk, and you can go from any place to any other place in, in, in two ways, in two directions, and you need to uh, you need to change only once. So we already start to 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 develop this. We develop already. We implant already 50% of the lines. Young people are starting to take the bus, and what is more important, I am starting to take the bus. So I, my office is here, and my house is here. One day, I, in fact, I do some tests. One day, I I, I say I will take the bus, and then the bus did like this, and, uh, and suddenly I was wrong, and I, I appear here. Well, anyhow, I will take the other bus down, and then I arrive to my house. So it makes sense to have a logical approach about how you move yourself in the city. What is more important is that we want, if we make this structure about bus, we want to remove cars here. So what we would like is that the structure of the city for the car will be something like this. This is, I mean, in Barcelona, 
this is thirty percent of people walk. We we have a lot of walk on, on public transportation, but the concept is this: we want to have cars here, and here will be more for bikes or local distribution. So what we'll do will be this is pedestrian, the dark blue, and we want to move to here. We want to remove 25% right now, 50% per car, 50% per people. We want to be only 25% for cars. And this is a radical transformation of the city. Radical transformation of the city and a lot of work for architects. Because once you remove the car, you need to transform the street, obviously. And then remember the mantra. We want to make uh, productive neighborhoods at human speed. And when we, every time we reduce the amount of cars, what we do is to extend the sidewalks. And when we extend the sidewalks, we try to introduce nature and places for, for kids. We introduce the back bike lines, and those are new. Well, look, this was the old sidewalk, and now we extend all of these. So we create a kind of a strange park sidewalk just in front of your house. No? So we want to develop such ideas all over the city. And then we'll create a diagram like this. That this is already Paseo de Gracia, our main avenue right now is like this, diagonal is like this. In the last three years, we have been doing several projects in that direction. So the last thing I would like to explain to you, in fact, is the, the model of Barcelona. This is the traditional city, the idea of a rich center and a poor periphery. There are other cities that have several centers, like LA or Seoul or many others. But there are other cities that has this structure of neighborhoods. The idea of the metropolis of neighborhoods, in fact, London or New York could have a structure like this. This is the scale of the neighborhood, and obviously London here will have the city. That means that we have one point like this. But what is important, in many studies that I saw about the city, everyone tried to explain how global they are. But now we try to look how local we are how we can develop this scale at the human speed around neighborhoods. So and the question is, what is a neighborhood? A neighborhood is a place where you can develop most of the function you need in order to live. And look at this, this is food. That means that we should have a market in every neighborhood, or we should have health center or education, culture, whatever. So that means that if you want to have a structure of neighborhood, the whole idea of living, resting, and working that are, uh, is the definition of a city should be developed at the scale of the neighborhood. So we start, this is the ideal neighborhood, a neighborhood where you can have some of these super blocks. So those are the buses, remember, this is more pedestrian, but then here you have in a distance less than 500 meters, you can find all the uh, facilities that you need in order to live. This is the 73 uh, uh, neighborhoods of Barcelona. But then, as I say, if we want to have an, a structure of neighborhoods, I mean, in Phoenix, Arizona, if you go to buy something, you need to take a car and go to a shopping mall. They have maybe 20 shopping malls because they are in a big scale. But in Barcelona, if you, want, if you want to develop this structure of neighborhood, you should have a market like this in every neighborhood. So this is the diagram of the markets in Barcelona. The standard for every market is 500 meters uh, walking distance. This is 25,000 people. And that means that in places like this, we are developing right now markets. In places like this, there are not 20,000 people. And uh, in places like this, there are some strength here. There is a shopping mall, in fact, and here there are shopping malls. So when you have a shopping mall, it destroys the model, obviously. So this is the markets, and this is the shopping mall structure. And then we use these public facilities in order to develop great architecture. So in Barcelona, we have very good small architecture. And we say in Barcelona that we have the worst building from the best architects. So every time that we call Erzon Hademeron, Zaha Hadid, or whatever, 
disaster. I mean, they make something that is not really great at all. There are many, they, they make great buildings, but not in Barcelona. Only Foster did, no, it's true, only Foster made the tower in the 90s that was great. The rest, you can find good architecture at this scale, but not in the big monuments. Libraries, again, if you want to have a structure of neighborhood, you need to have a library in every district. Libraries is incredible how the people go there. I mean, it's a place where the people go to study, to read, they have Wi-Fi access, etc. And we have an incredible structure of libraries that was built in the last 25 years. So this drawing costs like 500 million pounds because every library is something like, uh, yeah, it's like one million or two million pounds is something like this. So that means that every decision that you take about your model, it costs you money, obviously. You need to decide that you will do this during many times. This is the public health centers. And then what happened with digital fabrication? I brought, I made the first Fab Lab, in fact, in Europe. Uh, Fab Labs is this network organized by MIT. Well, the truth is that at the same time AA was doing here fabrication in their, your laboratory. We bought some machine to our laboratories, but we decided to open our laboratory to the people in the street in order to promote invention and innovation. And then what we learn, and then now that we are in the city, what we decide is to make one of these laboratories in one lab per district, at least. Because the idea is that the innovation or invention should be a public infrastructure. Libraries, 100 years ago, were closed in universities and were only in the houses of rich people. And now a library is a public service. So we want to make innovation 3D printing fabrication as a public service, obviously in parallel to any factory or any whatever that will happen. So that's why we start with two, we already developed two public fab labs. And that means that in Barcelona, we have five right now, two from IAC. And this is the one from the city that uh, we have events with kids, etc. So what we want is that these people become inventors of the future. We need to work with education and it will take 20 years, but those people will learn that they can do nearly everything. So this idea about being able to empower the people to be able to fabricate energy, food of things by yourself, sharing knowledge with other people is very well represented in these images. We want to move from here, from centralized production of energy to decentralized. This is the diagram that we explained during the campaign. That is, this is IAC, this is the block, the idea of the retrofitting, the blocks where we can produce energy, we can produce food, we can have also a biomass plant, and we can charge uh, build, uh, electrical cars with our buildings. If you make a self-sufficient block, you can do a self-sufficient neighborhood by connecting all of these. So the idea of the internet of everything, in this case, the internet of energy is very clearly represented. And what is another good news? A solar building is not a building with solar panels in the roof. Obviously, something else. And we have been working at IAC. We fabricate this solar house for the solar decathlon in the year 2010. Um, using, I mean, we fabricate in, in our institute using uh, parametric design, inventing these flexible solar panels. And well, the result was very strange because we got the award, the public award. We were the number one and we were the last from the jury's award. So it's very difficult. I mean, we were, there were 20 teams. We were the most bought from the people, the visitors, and the last from the jurors. So if your professors maybe sometimes say something wrong, you can ask your, your friends to comment your projects. Maybe you will get uh, better votes from your friends. The interesting thing is after this house we make at IAC, we, the year 2011, we make with Endesa this other pavilion with the idea that in this case was directly, literally charging cars, etc. 
And the idea is that this building should be only one slice of a solar building that will use the facades in order in one hand to make shadows to the windows, but in the other hand to produce energy. So we need, I mean, if we were at the Bauhaus 100 years ago, we were designing, at that moment, they were designing building with glass and steel. And now we'll be designing buildings that are self-sufficient, that use the internet of everything in order to run the building, to connect with other buildings. We'll be using digital fabrication in order to make everything. So this is exactly what you are learning here is how the world will be. Don't, don't doubt at all. I mean, the, it, I mean, the city or architecture is the, is the last art that is affected by the reality. As I say here, internet has changed our lives, but it hasn't changed our cities yet. But it will arrive and it will remain. I mean, the cell phone will disappear, but the building will remain. Remember the Romans, we are still dealing with Roman stones, no? So this was the last pavilion we did uh, during the, an event we organized last summer in Barcelona. In this case, instead to be active, it was a passive design. Daniel Ibáñez and Rodrigo Rubio that are uh, collaborators from IAC were helping on this. And that's all. This is Barcelona. If you come, please send me an email and I will try to explain you something literally in the walking around. Thank you. regular questions, now smart questions. Some smart people that want to make some smart questions. Don't be shy. Where does the funding come from for these projects? The funding in uh, Barcelona is a city that, uh, the good news is that it's a dense city. So when you imagine those that uh, work in China, Africa, or whatever, and will be developing new constructions of cities, the first decision to be taken is which is the density. Because Barcelona is like 15,000 inhabitants per uh, square kilometer. And in, in general, I mean, obviously Hong Kong is higher and Phoenix is much more lower. But this is a crucial decision because depending on this, you will have the same amount of streets and you will have the same, I mean, the trucks uh, collecting the, 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 the trash or clean the streets or whatever. And then you will have more or less people paying taxes. So the fact that Barcelona is a quite dense city make us that in general with the taxes that the people pay, we generate a superhabit and every year we invest between 300 to 400 million euros in the city itself. But this is the basic and also for maintenance, etc. This is the basic investment. Um, but the interesting thing is that in many of those projects, we need, especially in the station, you remember the station that now is really a slowdown, uh, we need to get external investment. In fact, the Mediterranean style, the way the city was built in many cases was the developers were trying to build cheap to sell expensive and run away. Very clear way to get fast money. And if you have an agriculture land and you transform into an urban land and you can resell it, that's great. You don't make anything, you only make money. So this is the traditional developer's approach. But in a city that is already built, and the question is the value that you put to the things, the question is that you can try to capitalize this value 
up front. And this is, could be more the British model that if you have the station here that you will have a hundred million people per year, that means that the commercial activity that will be developed there, you can try to sell upfront in order to finance the investment. So from that point of view, we are working, learning how to be more Northern and less speculative economy. Uh, and from that point of view, obviously, we, we, we would like to learn from you about this. But uh, I think everything that you saw was paid with the taxes from the people that they want to see. That's why we say it's so important the public space and the sensors and whatever, because we want to improve their quality of life. One smart question, incredible. Over there. So I really like your, um, I admire your effort in order to create, um, create self-sufficient neighborhoods. And you were talking about health care centers and li public libraries and many facilities that you can keep up in the neighborhood. But you were also saying you work in the one, hand, one end of the city and you live at the other end of the city. Yeah. And as we look at London, so London is, as you also showed in the model, it has many neighborhoods. But actually the main traffic that happens is commuting from work to home. So how are you actually planning this in a global city as Barcelona? Like how do you want to locate the work and the living situation in the same place. So how are you going to be able to plan this? Because... Thanks. Yeah, as I say, it's a smart question. <laughs> I have a stupid <laughs> answer, not a stupid, but... No, but, I mean, uh, obviously in the... Uh, there is a graphic I don't have in this drawing, but in the industrial economy, it was crucial to have big spaces for industry. For example, now we have here big space for industry. In fact, we have here a Nissan factory. We fabricate cars here and we have another industrial factory here. So that means that public transportation is so important because we will move people uh, in order to work from one place to another. And in London, it's incredible that in 90% of the people take the tube in order to move to work. Also the people from city, what is great. But the answer is this. In the information economy, the size of the companies or the structure of the economy is based in, in many small companies that create a big economy by somehow interaction. So I don't know if I have here, but we have the map, yeah, here. We did the map of the, oh, it's not here. It's not here. We did the map of the people working with the digital fabrication in Barcelona. And then we start to uh, learn that there are like 50 small companies around. Right now we are doing the, the map on the startups in Barcelona related with nanotechnology, biotechnology, etc. that in fact they have the form of small structures. So until now, in the industrial economy, there were workers and consumers and the boss. But all of them work in big buildings or in big companies. But with the information economy, we can have another economy that is more based on uh, startups, uh, middle and medium sized companies. So those companies can be placed anywhere in the city. In fact, we are trying to develop a map of, in order to demonstrate where people live and where people work. And in the areas like this, in the historical city, there are many, many people that live and work there and they want to work. So I was, I decided to live here and to work here because if I can decide, so that means if I am an entrepreneur, I can decide how I live. If I am a worker, I, I am an employee, Obviously, I need to follow the rules of the big structure. So in the new economy, there are more and more smaller structures, small companies, entrepreneurs, etc., that they can live everywhere. And that's why we decide, for example, this is 100% residential area. This is the first place where we put one fab lab. 
because we want that those people realize that they can start to think about to create a cooperative uh, and a structure that will allow them to work. It's true that this will, this change of economy, I mean, the industrial revolution took like 50, 60 to 70 years, 70 years from Manchester 1820s or something like this. And then by the end of uh, 20th century, we start to fabricate the first car. So that means that obviously it will take time we still need uh, public transportation. If I, I, I will need to decide, I will say that metro, it was a great structure. London has the first metro in the history. They were connecting two or three stations of trains. Uh, but it doesn't make sense to make new metro lines. What it makes sense is to start to reduce cars and start to have a better bus system or sharing cars. Young people, my son doesn't want to buy a car. He likes to buy a t-shirt or a cell phone, but he don't want to buy a car, no? My father, his status of a good man was to buy a car, no? So th this was the industrial economy. You need to buy a car. If you want to move yourself, you need to buy a car. Now you, in the information economy, you don't load an app, and then you decide if you share a bike, share a car, or take a bus. So from that point of view, obviously, we will still, I mean, I would say it's great that we still have industry inside the city, but uh, this will be, is, it will be more like the agriculture. Now there is only three or 4% of the people that works in the agriculture sector. And a hundred years ago was maybe 25%. So in the industrial robotic, I mean, in, in Nissan, here there are more than, there are 800 people and maybe 2000 robots making cars. In the big industry it will be more robotic, but here that we have a yacht a reparation, uh, for big jobs, we have more than 2,000 people doing craftsman and incredible digital fabrication, no? You understand? So my answer will say that we need to move ourselves, but I really want to promote that the people think not to become a worker of a big company, but to create their own company and they can create a startup and maybe will grow, etc. And to just uh, to pick up on, on a point that you made, particularly around education. Uh, recently here, the education secretary was trying to make a radical distinction between uh, STEM subjects and, let's say, arts and humanities. And it seems like one of the things that you speak through ideas of innovation and economy is really kind of facilitating a kind of general public knowledge and sort of advancing that through some of these initiatives. Where here, there seems to be a, a desire anyway in terms of education at the moment to separate that. You seem to bring science and technology with a kind of public face of creating civic uh, interventions together. And I know that you see that through the eyes of Barcelona, but I think it's important, I guess, from my perspective, knowing you for a while, what role do you see your, your uh, background as an educator, and in particularly in founding a school, and working with that kind of domain of a prototype, and now looking at the city from that same kind of prototypical perspective? It, it seems everything is scenario, and a lot of the things are being put and implemented quite quickly. What are some of the criteria you think, particularly with knowledge and education, with the everyday, let's say, the general public that you guys are going to use as ways of evaluating some of this? Well, one of the principles that we use at the IAC was this idea of learning by doing. So university in general, uh, we're trying to uh, separate the knowledge. And in fact, we have a separation between architects and engineers. And it's strange because the engineers, they decide to break in silos, the mechanical engineer or the telecom or whatever. And architects, we are still one, it's a little bit like doctors, still we are quite generalistic, have a quite generalistic approach. But the other question is that, and this is something we learn using machines, that the old architect was someone waiting for a client to get a commission and in order to make a design that someone else will build. 
but the new architects are those that in general they invent their commission and they make the design but they try also to fabricate directly by themselves so from that point of view this idea of learning by doing makes that the difference between theory and practice is very small sure. i think that today this idea is really uh, blu is blurring the limits are a blur because if not you, you are waiting for a job and that's the drama that if the people are is educated to follow some rules the result is that they will not have they will have no job when we organized this event this was fab 10 the world meeting of all fab labs around the world more than 500 fab labs around the world they come to barcelona we make the biggest lab ever done in one week we have uh, many three printers, lasers, etc. We have the journalists asking, uh, asking Neil Hassan from MIT. They were asking, how many people, how many unemployed people did you bring to the festival? Trying to say, hey, those are young people, but you are not very good from the social point of view because you don't bring immigrants that I don't unemployed. And his answer was. Well, those people are not unemployed because they invented their job. If not, they will be unemployed. So the question is not about who will make a, an, a, a, who will give me unemployment. No one will do it. And if you get it, it will be great. But you should forget about that someone will take the responsibility about you. And this is, in fact, a very important revolution. And this is related about how, who, is ruling the world and how the world is organized. This is what happened. It's happening right now in Catalonia, but happened also in this Arab Spring, and it's happening in many places where the people really are trying to get the responsibility to run their lives. Their lives is not organized by buying a car, getting a girlfriend, being married, and paying alone, and then die. No, it's more about no. This is what my father learned. He worked all his life in one company. No, this is what they were in the fifties were like this. Now you are free. You feel you are free. You need to invent your future. So if you are, if many people are doing like this, will be doing like this, then cities will be different. And so how this is what we are trying to promote. We are bringing a STEAM education to the poorest neighborhood in Barcelona. But another thing we are doing is what we call social mining. We go to a neighborhood where 50% of people are immigrant, where we have people from Africa, from Latin America, etc. And in general, they complain because they want a job. And in general, they are waiting a job in a factory to make whatever, no? But what is interesting is if you were asking the people what you know to do, he would say, well, I know to repair cars. What do you know to do? I know to make furniture. So that means that the people knows many things in general everyone has some potential to do something but what they don't understand is that or we don't understand is that instead to look for an employment for those people we're looking to those people and asking what they know to do and try to help to develop their potentials so the new approach is really to look about to the people and and say what what are they able to do let's do it together no this is what why we make things like this i mean when we, the mayor sometimes look at me because remember the first slide with the mayor at the act presenting this, he told me, Vicente, the people thought you were crazy and you were really stupid, no? Talking about digital fabrication in Barcelona. But we, we already opened two labs and we, we destroyed the highway. I mean, we did many incredible things following a strong principle. And again, I say, and I see some people here uh, from the Middle East. When I go there, I say, we don't want to buy petrol from you. We don't want to make rich you buying petrol and contaminating our air. It doesn't make sense. We don't want to, because we want, we can run cities in another way. I really admire what uh, Dubai, Abu Dhabi and other places because they are taking the money that they are able to, to get right now in order to make cities and to improve the, the quality of life of the territory. That's really impressive. But from our point of view, it's completely wrong that we don't make our energy in our cities and we buy energy from Russia and then Russia sometimes they make some deals about 
something, no? <laughs> Please array from the camera. <laughs> okay. Just ask, uh, how robust are your plans for uh, Barcelona in case the administration changes later on? Because you're already three years in. So are they strategic plans agreed by everyone? Is that something that you're trying to do as much as you can while the mayor is there? Yeah, you know, well, this is true. And obviously we are making drawings. And uh, you know, what I learned is that we have been half of our mandate finishing projects that someone else start. So we are Barcelona is a city where in general we try to keep the, the continuity on what we do. But obviously the important thing is the long-term vision because, but another thing that I learned is if you talk, it's very strange because if you talk with a more radical ecologist, they will say something that is very similar to what uh, we say. Um, our mayor is, let's say, social democrat, but sometimes they say that he's a little bit centered, he's nationalist. But anyhow, uh, he's not radical left. But if you talk about someone that say, okay, what do you want to do? We are more radical than what they, basically because we do what we say. What we found is that there are many people that they like to give lessons of moral about how the world will be, should be, but in fact, they don't really do too much. So that means that I think that there are two options or this vision or Blood Rainer, Blade Runner. I mean, it's kind of chaos where there is someone rolling the world, NSA, please erase it. Uh, another, someone controlling information, people selling more petrol that are extracting after some earthquakes uh, somewhere in the world. So that means that there is some kind of world where the people really is in power or kind of uh, this democracy of information can bring to some dictatorship of, of information. So that means that it's true that in three years or four years it's impossible to make a radical change. Uh, what we would like to, to make is to define uh, which sport we want to play. What is important is that all of us, the government and the opposition, we decide to play the same sport and it will win the one that is able to play better. But the discussion is not if we play football or we play basketball, you understand? When we did the Olympic Games, really everyone was focused on the Olympic Games. And right now the people is more focused on the independence. So this is more the big focus. And if we are able to do something like this, it will be much more money to develop something like this. And uh, I mean, when I say that we'll make buildings that make energy, that will store the energy in the electrical cars, the people say, 20 years, but it's incredible because we already have uh, 10 electrical taxis in New York, in Barcelona, I don't know if you have here in London, uh, and this is something is already there, is arriving. The taxi driver, the electrical taxi driver, he charged his battery with one euro, and he used to spend 30 euros to, ch to, f to fill his oil tank. So, I mean, the future will be like this or will be Blade Runner, it's very clear. And then the question is how fast will it be? This is, from my point of view, the only discussion. For this great plan, did you actually approach the people of Barcelona and ask them for their opinion? Because you're changing their entire city. So did you ask what they think about it, about these future plans? Yeah, th th that's a very interesting question because Many people talk about the participation and the discussion, etc. We have one, we have, I would say the following. We, we have more than 90 process, 90 process of discussion with citizens in different areas in the city about how to transform that area. And in the square, we are able to demolish the highway because the citizens, they wanted. And in fact, basically we follow obviously what, and in fact, the, uh, the former politics that were rolling the city, that sign that we will demolish, the day that they needed to vote to put 25 million euros there, they say no. So in general, citizens are more consistent about what they think than not politics. But the other question is, remember the beaches? There was no one asking for beaches. There were no demonstrations, we want beaches. 
No. I mean, in general, the big, incredible things, the citizens, they don't ask for them. Why? Because they cannot imagine that this could happen. In fact, we have another experience here uh, that is the place where there was more discussion, the biggest participation process. The former, I would say that the former administration maybe was not, they have, it was not so clear about the, the ideas and they had a huge participation process and maybe it's the worst square in the city. So the biggest, because some citizens say we would like to draw and the architect will follow our hand, no? I would say no. I mean, my opinion is, obviously, I want to discuss when we did the competitions about the coisal gates, about the nature, before to start to draw, we had meetings with the citizens and we were asking what they think. But architects, we need to draw and then we can discuss. But the question is that the citizen doesn't make the city. The citizen, they leave the city. I would say another way. They make the city, but they don't design the city. The idea when you need to make an intervention is like a doctor. If you need to cut, you need to have an expert. If we need to have this idea of bringing nature back, you need to discuss with them. But in general, citizens think about what they have in front of them and they don't think in a big scale. And in a city, you need to have in a big middle, you need to think about many scales. So from that point of view, obviously, everything that we do is because we agree with the citizens. But you cannot ask citizens to the... I would like to make a plan in order to make a library. They never think in this long term and big scale. Is there a last question? And we'll bring this to each other. Uh, I understand all your hypotheses uh, that you are designing a, a city for small scale uh, companies. Uh, and I have read your books and I understand all, all that is about that. But uh, wouldn't this penalize uh, the big companies that with all the investments to come to the cities or if they go to, be, uh, to create uh, hot spots of uh, transport movements uh, outside the city, I mean on the surroundings? No, what, what I would say is that we design the city for all the scales. So what I say is that our model is the metropolis of neighborhoods. So this is an investment of five billions here. The uh, central train station, high speed train station, it will cost 500 million euros. And then you see here there will be a huge investment of uh, so that means that it's not to think the city about the small scale. But look at this. This, is, this was in the windows. Remember the windows? The, when you think about the business, here th they were making blocks that were blocking the connection between neighborhoods. And here what we want to do is to use this in order to improve the quality of life of people and to connect neighborhoods. So it's a question of principle about which kind of projects you, you, you do, not obviously we think about big, small, small scale. And which was, sorry, the last question? That if uh, they keep going to the city, if they wouldn't go just to the surroundings, making... Yeah, yeah. that's another very interesting question because in, um, in, in the 90s, when uh, the Silicon Valley started to, I mean, to export their economical model, because remember in the 90s they, they didn't exist cell phones, etc., and uh, we start to listen that there is someone that make a computer, Apple that makes no, this kind of. So the first uh, uh, implantation was here, was the periphery of the city. The, those information companies were copying the urban model of the Silicon Valley in order to come to most of our cities. And I am sure here in London you will have industrial parks that were these kind of places in the periphery with some parks. And in, in, in India, it's full of these kind of places, new cities with many green, etc. But what we realize, HP, the central large format HP factory is here, and the headquarters for HP3 printing 
will be here because it's the place where they they were they came in the 90s. But what we realize is that the best place for the the innovation economy is the city itself because basically you need to develop areas where companies are near the university, young people can find kind of uh, cheap, uh, cheap uh, rental offices to, uh, to be placed. No? So that's why we develop what is called the 22 at neighborhood that is exactly here. So all this area with the tower, the university is our, let's say, technological district. So that means that we absolutely, we are thinking about how we bring big companies, but in many cases, those companies, they don't have a big factory in the city. We have two fact car factories in Barcelona, but the, the, I mean, the, it will be more the economy, uh, I mean, the economy related with offices and big company will look like more like this, than not like this one floor, huge building, full, full of robots making whatever. And obviously, look at this. This is Barcelona, and we are developing this smart city campus. Cisco will come here in an old factory. Here will come the university. We are opening the Museum of Urbanism here. So we are still developing some areas for companies uh, here in the center of the city. We need to attract companies, and they will come here. But it's very difficult that a Chinese company decide to bring his factory of cars to Barcelona because, in fact, doesn't make sense. They need to make... I imagine that in 20 years, we'll have an open source car factory here that will be producing 100 cars per year than not someone that will fabricate in 100, I mean, or 10,000 cars per year, no? This is exactly what is happening now where people from IACI is starting to make a open source car. So the city always will find place where we can bring new companies about the big industry. I mean, uh, uh, this will happen more if they need a huge, huge space, very cheap, it will happen in the periphery or we, we, we will discuss about Catalonia as Barcelona. I mean, we'll discuss about the region is like to talk about London, but not the city, but the, let's say the, the region of London as the place where the industry could come, no? I don't imagine here a factory of cars. I imagine a factory of open source cars. I had incredible questions from you. Um, that's amazing. Thank you. You studied in a great school. I was studying in Valencia. That was a very bad school. I always say that I was <laughs> I was very lucky because I studied in, in a very bad school and because I knew it, I was always traveling. So that's why I learned some, I knew so many people. But uh, I mean, sorry, you are in a great school and I hope that you will do the right revolution in the future. Thank you.